Testing. So, hello, hi, everybody. Um, uh, welcome to the uh, the last of my webinars. So, this is a an extra session, and it's a Q and A. So, I've been taking loads of questions from you. Thank you very, very much indeed for all of those. Um, so, just as usual, um, what we'll do is as I'm proceeding through the whole thing, you just put your questions. If you have any further questions, this whole webinar is based on your questions from the last five that I've done. If you have any more ones, put them in chat and I will revisit them at set intervals throughout the whole of this thing. So thank you. It's fantastic to be here again. So now, this is Simon's question and loads of other people as well have been asking about primary impressions for RPDs. So for partial dentures, how do I actually do the primary impressions? What's my usual technique? Well, I love using this two part impression material. So I have a runny material that goes into here, into a syringe. And what I'm trying to do is with primary impressions, all I'm thinking about is recording the full depth of the sulcus and injecting it in the orange material in here, which is it's called neocolloid and it's made by Zermac. Then I mix it up into here and in the tray itself, I have a, a base alginate, a thicker material. That's the blue stuff there. That's called tropic algin. And then I can just inject in and all the way around. It works a treat. Um, it's exactly the same for lowers. If I'm doing a, a lower partial denture like that. So it's again, it's a stock tray. And in this case, if you look closely at the right hand side photograph here of that um, impression, um, this is a free end saddle partial denture arrangement and so the saddle areas the free end saddle the bases i want to record those um, all the way back the full depth of the sulcus and getting and recording the retromolar pad fully on it and injecting it using the syringe is wonderful for doing this it's beautiful so this is how i do this now um, i realize that some of you won't have this available in practice. So um, an alternative way of doing that impression and to, to capture the edentulous areas where there's no teeth, put compound in, in those areas there, and then do a wash in alginate over the top. Or alternatively, use putty to record the freehand saddles first. So you pop that in first, wait for it to set, take it out, and then this enables us to record a lovely impression to get a proper, and it all the whole point is, what we're trying to do is to get a primary cast on which we can design a perfect special tray, a correctly extended special tray. That's the whole point. So, thank you, Atal. Um, Atal sent me lots of questions. Some, you know, really good ones. So, which which trays, which custom trays, which special trays do I perforate, and which ones do I not? What are the rules? So, quite simply, for my complete denture, definitive impressions using custom trays, the tray itself is non perforated and there's two reasons that i do that number one the first reason is the impression material doesn't pull out of these if we use adhesive um, so there's no issue with them pull it pulling out because there's no teeth for it to grip on and to pull out of the impression tray and that means that what is really important with this is secondly though what I really want to do is when I've done my border molding with green stick, I want to see if we've got a peripheral seal on it. And if there's perforations in the tray, I can't tell whether there's a peripheral seal. So, and then quite 
and what I do is at this point here, so once I've done the border molding, this, the upper, I do in alginate. So I put adhesive on that all over the tray and on the periphery, all over the edge. And for the lower, which I'm going to be doing zinc oxide, I dry that thoroughly and the zinc oxide paste sticks to it beautifully. So these go in and then we, I border mold those. So they're functionally designed to sit beautifully within the mouth and not move at all around. So, so that is the, my impressions there for a denture, for a complete denture itself, non-perforated. The only time I'll have a perforated tray for a edentulous case is if we have a flabby ridge, and that's where we have a window, which I've shown um, throughout the uh, techniques that we've been uh, showing in these webinars. Anyway, now, Atal also asked me specifically about the partial denture custom tray design. So here it is, in a nutshell, it's very, very simple. So over the teeth, it's nicely spaced because I don't want that inner surface of the tray scraping on the teeth. That's important. And because the impression material will lock around the teeth themselves, we have these holes incorporated that they're like rivets. And then the impression material will flow through there, set, and it'll grip it in place. And on the edentulous area here, this is spaced with 1.5 millimeter space. So that's how that is constructed there. So, and, and that edentulous area is just dealt with in exactly the same way as I would do for a complete denture. Compound is then placed directly onto the ridge. So onto that edentulous ridge there. That's it. And importantly, just like with a complete denture, we avoid any green stick around the retromolar pad and then green stick all the way around here on that lingual surface so we can record the depth and width of the sulcus there. So that goes in. I do my border molding. Now, the important thing about this is what I really like about this technique is with using this green stick on the saddle itself is this acts like an Applegate technique and it compresses that tissue where that saddle is going to be just like um, the altered cast technique, otherwise known as the Applegate technique. So, and I put lots of adhesive on and for my definitive impressions for chromes, I love alginate. So, and these are the impressions taken using that specific tray. So this is actually um, Sandra. And I'll be showing Sandra just later because Sandra's got some really lovely rest seats on here. And I want to talk about those in a minute. But this is the, this is a beautiful look at that lovely impression of that freehand saddle going all the way back there. And they, all these little holes in the impression tray have riveted and holding that in, impression material in place. So that's really good. So the other question that Atal asked in his email to me was what is my rationale? Why do I use certain impression materials? So, and quite simply um, with this is that I, I love alginate for my definitive impression uppers. It's got a lovely, we can actually mix it nice and thin. So it flows beautifully into uh, the full depth of the sulcus for the definitive impression. But also what I think is really, really important with alginate is that it is hydrophilic. So it loves moisture. Um, and so it will flow into and behind the tuberosities. And what I find with when I'm working with silicones, for instance, which is that yellow material on the right there, say, and I have experimented with these over time, um, it just doesn't like to go where the moisture is. So it's a, however, 
this is really, really important. And people ask me about this all the time. The most important about impression materials, the most, the critical part to get right is the border molding with the green stick. That is the key to great impressions. And then what you use, what, uh, what anyone, what we use as a wash impression, like the alginate or silicone is unimportant if the, with the overall result. It's whatever works best in your hands. So if you have used, if you've got really good experience of using silicone, use it. It's great. So, and this brings me to the lower impression here. So for full lowers, I love zinc oxide eugenol. I realize it is, it's a really old fashioned material, but it flows beautifully. Who cares that it's old fashioned? It works beautifully and it has the, a lovely consistency. Um, in the lower, because it's a U shape, it's a horseshoe shape, I, it requires less pressure to actually seat it. And so it flows better than alginate for me, for my standard lower impressions. And I love it. Look at the left-hand picture there where it's, we've got a lovely border molded um, area where it's like a neutral zone and it, it allows Rowan to wax the denture up beautifully in that area. Now I know that occasionally, and it's, it's not like super common, but occasionally um, some patients have an allergy to um, zinc oxide so I as an alternative I find Imprigum works beautifully as well. Um, Imprigum has the advantage that it is also highly um, hydrophilic as opposed to silicones um, so it, it works really well it's, it's great for implant work too but I find it gets lovely detail for lowers and then very, very occasionally in the lower, if we've got, I've got a really painful lower ridge, then alginate is superb for these. But I do it in, in a special way, specific way, where with the impression, I've got the impression here, I actually put green stick on the fitting surface to start off with and press that and do my border molding with that and do it on the fitting surface as well, which is different than normal. But I make sure I put it, I reheat it and put it back in so I can press firmly onto those tissues before and make sure it's not sore when I'm pressing down and then do that wash in alginate to get the detail. So quite important that I think that's great. So another question as well is that if we just move back to primary impressions again, Angel asked a really important question, which is totally normal to ask is with an FCB tray, with this frame cutback tray, this lovely one that Dr. Arbe is designed for primary impressions, these frame cutback areas, is the alginate when we take the impression unsupported in those areas? So, and that, it isn't actually, it really does hold beautifully because the base material is so solid. So it doesn't push out the Rowan though, and uh, Rowan and Sam, my dental technicians are so careful though with it. And I think it's, it's important that we package it carefully when it's sent to the technician and then the technician looks after it so built up a really big chunky bit of plaster and then just carefully fits that in and preserves every detail from this you know so that we have a a really superb primary cast and the whole point of this primary cast is for us to produce a superbly extended special tray that's the whole point of this. The primary impressions were, it's like mapping out the topography of where we want to position the special tray. So the, the primary impressions overextended and the primary impressions are not border molded. This is really important. We only border mold the definitive impressions. 
And this brings me to another question, which is a really another great question, which Matt asked me via um, by, via YouTube, actually. He'd seen one of the videos, the webinars, and he'd said, if we have a really superbly done primary impression, why can't we just make the denture on that? And what's the point in having this tray there that we border mold? And can't we just make it from the primary cast? Of course we could. We could make it from the primary cast, but the denture will not fit as well. It won't be border molded specifically by the patient to the optimum extension. So the whole point of doing the primary impression is to produce a special tray that is perfectly extended like this. And we've talked about this in the last few webinars. This is probably out of, for, for everything we've talked about, is probably one of the most important pictures that, that I'm showing you over the, the, um, these six webinars. And it's, you can download it from the website. I'll show you how to do that later. But importantly, let's have a look at point number three here. Let's go here. It says point number three. So the buccal shelf is two millimeters short of the buccal edge of the mandible. So the special tray is, and this is essentially the same all the way around. It is the tray is slightly short of the, the full width of the denture that we're wanting. And this allows us to add green stick in various areas to border mold that green stick to the optimum depth and width of the sulcus. And then we do a wash impression over that in zinc oxide. And it, it looks like this once we've done it. And we get the patient. So because the special tray is slightly short of that, all of this impression material, it comes out and it rolls around that edge as we're actually doing the impression as we are getting the patient to do functional movements. So it's like E, U, lick the lip, push against the strut and swallow whilst I'm holding that tray in place. And so all of those lovely, beautiful border molding functional movements are made. And that gives us a lovely shape to a denture, which will stay as stable as possible during the patient's function. You know, when they're eating, talking, laughing, kissing, smiling, sticking their tongue out, doing all these things that we do as social creatures, it's gonna be as stable as possible during those functional movements. So now this is an opportune moment for me now just to check the chat. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to have a look at the, your questions and then see if there's anything here. Doo -doo. So Keith has asked, Keith Wainwright, when you have cobalt chrome um, chromes, made you have full rings on the retaining posterior teeth with a clasp into the mesial undercut what is the purpose of this keith it is slightly out you're right it's uh, it's it's a little bit out of sync but don't worry can you see that that's a ring rest on a denture there with a a clasp that comes down in chrome and engages the undercut there. So it's, it's, it's got two parts. So the rest part is the ring on the top. And so the ring itself adds, adds support. And then this clasp arm comes down and engages the mesial of that tooth to retain it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's actually adding, it's helping with that, support with the rest and also stability with the rest and retention with the clasp. They work superbly. Just even a, just a ring rest on its own works beautifully. As long as we've got a clasp further forward, you know, so we've got two clasp per denture. So 
Hi, everyone. Hi, Lila from Cork, John from Italy, and Alicia from um, Australia. Hi, Drew in Burke. Lovely to see you. And Alan from Longford. Brilliant. Shazza from India. So, uh, thank you very much, Marana. Thank you very much. What do you think about Altair? AKP high performance polymers for the removable partial dentures. Thank you, Marana. Yep, um, I've not tried Ulta AKP, but I have made peak dentures. I think they look lovely and work pretty well, but we can't get them quite as thin as chromes at the moment and have the same stability and rigidity. So, actually, my patients prefer the comfort of chromes and they feel that they are more uh, they accept them better in the mouth so but it's watch this space and i do use them i do use high performance polymers if the patient has a allergy to cobalt chrome which is super rare so do do anu hyphen lee please could you give your top tips on using molar plus b as a denture liner anu absolutely i can give you my top tips and the top tips are in a DVD and actually a video on YouTube and I will show you where to find it at the end and it's got everything about a Moloplast B denture because it's got one of the most difficult cases I've ever treated in it so that will be perfect for you. Sony Cotecture, if you're using putty or compound for primary imps for free and saddle lowers are you trying to capture the retromolar pad with this so you get a mucodisplasive impression of the retromolar pad or do you pick this area up in alginate for mucostatic record of retromolar pad yeah sonny the second part of your uh, question is correct i want a mucostatic impression of the um of the retromolar pad that's really important so um, I don't want to squidge it. So I would avoid pressing it hard. Um, Burke Kakaf or Kafaf. What do you make boxing with alginate impression? So Burke, just like you saw with that primary impression, we don't box them. Rowan just brings the cast right the way around, uh, round the impression tray, and then uses a knife just to trim it, but still preserving that very, very important land area here. So you can still get a lovely land area without boxing the impression in with wax. All it is is just bringing it all up and over the top. Anthony Coe, what's my opinion on future of digital dentures? So, um, future of digital dentures is it's happening and it's coming. And I think the impressions are not there yet, Anthony, you know, so we need to, because we've got soft tissues that, and we're trying to record um, every, all we're trying to record in, in not just like a three dimensional, it's like four dimensions. So it's the patient's movement as well. So scanning at the moment, instead of doing impressions, isn't there yet. We don't have scanning to record time um all the different movements and we don't have scanning to record the depth like an ultrasound so when they come in then that's going to be amazing but we will i don't personally because we make everything handmade at the practice and we and it, it still it fits beautifully and we haven't found digitally t making the dentures printing them or or actually milling them to give us what we're wanting in terms of aesthetics and function. But Anthony, it is coming. Printing of dentures. So, so yeah, would you please talk a little bit more about making a complete denture for one jaw for a patient when she has opposing teeth? What are the possible complications of this case to compared with dual arch complete denture for a young dentist? What tips and tricks? So yeah, I'm just gonna to touch on that later. So, so Soraya, also I would really appreciate if you can talk about how to know where to do chair side adjustments in RPD on its base or clamp and what kind of adjustments do you do? So yeah, I'll talk about that. So do do. Someone sent me a private one, said ZNOE is great but messy. 
Impigum is better in hospitals you use them so that's fine that's your opinion but i think zinc oxide is so neat and tidy as well it's just so lovely if if you use it carefully and use these little retractors it just works beautifully but we you know it's fine we've all got different opinions uh amir zoe is quite brittle and chip on the edges no not at all I don't I really don't find that if we've got a lovely border molded edge and we look after it it's um it's you know you just got to be careful you're right it isn't as robust as Impregon but it's it's less brittle than um uh, alginate you know you can so So Shazza Ahmed's asked about specific rules for maxillary special trade construction as well yep absolutely just look on the my download construction manual and you'll find it there um, and it's also on all of my other webinars just look up the complete denture webinar which was webinar number three shows that you'll be able to find that no problem could you please put yourself in full screen please yes i think i am on full screen Do, do. And Angela's just asked about face bows. I'll be talking about that just in a minute, Angela, for you. So, um, so Andreas has asked me about a case with lower three to three, four to lower three to thirty three to four to three of splinted crowns, and we need to replace with new crowns. And then do an RPD for the, for the posteriors. How do you connect the RPD and the new splinted crowns? Design of RPD connection thoughts, etc. Gosh, blimey, that's uh, <laughs> uh, I don't. Pro if you're going to make splinted crowns on them, then I would do the splinted crowns, but not you know just with rest seats on, nice rest seats, and I would fit them. And then make an impression of that. So I'd permanently or fit cement the those crowns and then do an impression of that for the chrome. That's if we've just got nice little passive rest seats. But if you're going to do milled attachments with really precise slots in there, then the crowns need to be made and then tried in first and fitted temporarily with Vaseline and temp bond and then do a pickup impression of that with border molding the posterior bits as well so that the chrome is made to fit against the crowns that's how to do that andreas do do so do you prep heinz asked me do you prep for the tooth ring rest yes i do just to bring in the edges a little bit just with a diamond um, rugby ball shaped burr, just a little bit of odontoplasty, which just allows the ring rest to sit beautifully. Anthony Bailey's asked me about what do we do about over, you know, dentures extended. Where do we place the post down with patients who gag? So just really quickly, because this is a question that has, I've been asked at virtually every webinar so far, is keep it extended fully round the back here. For the dentures but this bit here that center part we can compromise and we can bring it forward Anthony on that so that's what I generally do with this so so that's superb and then Sonny has asked about little retractors so for doing the impressions they are photographic ones that I just took through to the lab and I ground them down and took the edges off so it just made them into little hooks there so some really old dog-eared photographic retractors then just do you cut them down it works beautifully so malcolm do a dog do dog poo lower that's true that's phrase of record it's a great way of doing it superb do do
No. Angela, did I add ribbon wax to the lower imp path? No, we don't. Rowan just pulls it all the way up to the edge, right up over the top, but it still preserves that lovely land area. So, and also I've had a private message saying thoughts about tissue conditioning protocols, duration materials and choices. So, um, that is a good question too. So, yeah, someone's asked me actually earlier as well, just before I came on air this evening about pre-prosthetic surgery, you know, big bits of, of, uh, of tissue that may have overgrown around the denture. So what I do is with that is quite simply, if I've got overgrowth of tissue, then I trim away that flange that's causing that. And then I put in there Viscogel or CoSoft, and then that conditions the tissues. And it really doesn't take too long to go. But in terms of giving you set protocols, in terms of timings, I can't do that because it takes, sometimes you've got a massive growth and it may take a month or so to go. And, um, and other times it's just not, it doesn't require much at all to actually make the, to condition the mouth. But pre, I think, I think there are times, and I think this is really, really important though. Um, so, is that often when we've got a patient with a high frenum, and they often do have, if you can see this denture there, we've got in that there, quite often the, this frenum there, the buccal frenum, is almost at the level of the ridge itself. So, and that means when the patient smiles there, then an air, air can get in underneath the denture and cause the denture to drop. So an air leak can occur. So, and I know that surgeons, oral surgeons, can actually just make, remove that frenum quite straightforwardly and get increased depth to actually increase the suction effect of the denture. So it's not something that I do because I find that even with something like that, if we do really good border molding, we can get around it. But it is something that is possible to do. Do do. Someone's asked me about: Do I put double post downs for patients that gag? No, I don't, because, and this is you know the concept is: Do we put two post downs on a denture? So one at the back and one further forward. And if they can't tolerate the back one, then we cut it further forward. Um, I. I don't put double on because I don't think I get it fitting as well because that second post down quite, quite often stops it from fully seating and sinking in and getting good suction anyway. So I just do one, but this is really important knitting. If the patient can't tolerate the back edge because we've got our master model, we can, I can score a new post down on it and then Rowan can add and a new post dam on that denture further forward really easily and just do it in a few a matter of half an hour it's not a big deal right i'm going to crack on so back to screen share so let's have a look here so thank you very much i'm just going to minimize those questions, here we go. So next, OVD and face boat. Someone's asked about face boat tonight. Now, the question is, and this is, you know, if you don't have access to a Gothic arch tracing point, central bearing point, then what is the best way of recording the, uh, the right CR? and vertical dimension so without the gothic arch tracing so and also how do we use the face bow it's really simple this so just a sec i'm just gonna make get this right here lovely now so this is so if we now fast forward to visit this would be visit three for complete dentures so in order to record the occlusion really well it's a conventional upper rim so this is a shellac base with a big plenty of wax on it so i can carve that back because i like to carve it rather than adding to it it's much easier for me to do that but this is the key to the lower this is a manchester rim it's it's essentially a pivot 
So from the six to the four, we have wax blocks embedded onto a light cure base. And these are so good for trimming. So this is what it looks like in the mouth. So we have the, this lower pivot just closes up against the upper rim there like that. And we just trim it. And I'll just take you through the whole process. But the basic concept behind the lower pivot or, or Manchester rim, that's what we call it, the Manchester rim, is it's easier to trim it, to marry it up against a full upper rim than a full lower block is to marry it up against the upper, quite simply. So, and the whole thing about Visit 3 is really, we're wanting to, at first, mimic or put the teeth back in the patient like Henry here, in the same place as where his natural teeth would be. So, and it's using that photo is absolutely key to this. So, but I've had loads of questions about this. Ariel sent me a lot of questions. And one of those was this, how do you make the rims stay put and other people have? So at visit three, this is what I do. I cut a post dam in the definitive cast. And this is how I do it. This is my method. So what I on the definitive cast, I want to cut into the model around the back of the tuberosity about one millimeter depth when we're crossing this soft tissue bit where you know we've got the connective tissue and then when we get to the middle we've got the fovea palatini i cross the fovea and do that slightly shallower at 0.5 millimeter and then increase the depth all the way back around the back of the tuberosity here so that's one millimeter and then chamfer it out here so this is sealing this area here. This is really important. This is how I do it. And I think of, in my mind, when I'm doing this, I think it, that the Cupid's bow, can you see I've just put some lips here and this lovely Cupid's bow shape to this. So this is what I do. This is a definitive model here. Can you see that this is an imprint of the old denture where the post dam is short? And I'm bringing it back further back here because I want maximum suction on it. So I draw with a pencil where I want it. And I've looked in the mouth to see where the fovea palatini are. So right in the middle, I've taken it across. And then I'm going to draw it into where these the connective tissue is here. So these are the soft bits just there. So once I've done that, I soak the model in water for about a minute because these definitive models are really hard. They're rock hard. They've got stone in, 50% stone. So, and then I scratch it out. This is speeded up, but I use one of the tools. The two tools I love using are a Lacron carver, which is this. It's brilliant for prosthetics. And the other one that I love using is a wax knife. They're my two go-to tools. Cut out the post dam like that. And then the back edge of the tray, sorry, of the rim, I warm up in the Bunsen burner and then feed it into that uh, post dam. And it helps to make the rim stay in place because I don't want it moving around. So, and then the other thing that is important is that Rowan makes the, the pivot, the lower rim and the upper to the full depth and width of the sulcus. So we are maximizing our retention and support and stability for the rims too. So, and here we are, this is us at the registration stage. And like I've mentioned all the time is what Claire and I are trying to do, we're trying to visualize Julie here and our patient. If they had teeth, we want to visualize what she would look like if she had a natural teeth. And the dentate pictures are key to this. And this is where Claire and I, we just have a dialogue. But this is what's really important about this stage. I can't emphasize how important 
so important the patient is sitting up in the chair upright if the head's back like this i can't i can't see them in a social position i can't properly visualize it so that's really important and the set order to this is i trim the lip support first get that right secondly do the incisal plane using a fox's bite plane and holding that the rim onto the model and using my wallpaper scraper I heat it up over the bunsen burner and then you press my plate on that and heat it up and get that parallel with the interpupillary lines number three i get this parallel with the I get the upper rim parallel with the Ayla tragus, which is crucial to getting superb aesthetics. If we looked at all of us now and looked at the upper occlusal plane, all of our occlusal planes are within a one degree of being parallel with the Ayla tragus. It is a terrific landmark, and this makes the dentures look amazing. It makes them look amazing, really important. And then four and five, what I do is I trim the buccal corridors with reference to the photograph and then put the center line on too. So, and that is those five steps quite simply with the help of Claire is the upper rim sorted. And then we come to look at the lower rim and the lower rim I first First of all, adjust that for the correct vertical dimension. And I, again, I've had loads of questions about, Finn, how do you assess the vertical dimension properly? What do you use? Do you not use a Willis bite gauge or dots on the nose, the speech tests? I don't use any of those tests. I use the John Coyce method. If the patient looks right, they are right. And so when I'm it's important that Rowan's built these up quite high. So when I put it in, it's it, the patient, it looks a bit over open and I'll look at Claire and she'll do this at me. They're over open. So that me, that is my indication to trim a little bit off. So I trim it down just with the wax knife, close them back down. And then we have a look at them again and we just do it until the patient looks at rest and at peace. Um, if anything, we will close them down more than over open them. So if in doubt, this is what I think. If in doubt, close them down a little bit. So, so once we've, we've got the vertical looking good, patient looking good it's now time to record centric relation and i want you to think about this now really visualize that we've got the patient you've got the patient in the surgery now and you're sitting with them and we've got this lower rim in and i want these i want to get the patient and i put my fingers on either side of the pivot i get them to open holding it down and I ask the patient, curl, your tip, curl the tip of the tongue to the back of the upper denture and close together. So I don't say bite, I just say close together. And often what I feel is the patient's lower jaw will go clunk back. I can just feel it go back into CR and then close together. And then I double check that it's all marrying up. And what I've done is, you can't see it very clearly here, but I put a line on there all the way down on both sides. And I double check that those lines marry up. And when I'm happy that they're marrying up, I will also take them out and cut a groove in both upper and lower and fit them back in the mouth. And then, but I want to see this happening. This is the patient opening and closing here in a reproducible position, which I'm hoping is CR. Can't be fully certain because the Gothic arch 
tracing is really good for that but this is the second best and it, this is good if you can't be working a system that you can't afford to use the gothic arch and it's too expensive this is fine so i want to double check everything's marrying up perfectly and it's stable so that's first and then i then inject at this point with the patient biting together with claire holding the retractors and the, the patients together i squirt in foot rd between everything so the patient is not closing down through that medium they're touching together first and then the foot rd bite registration is squirted in and i wait for two minutes for it to set and then that is my, our intermaxillary record done I then take this out of the mouth, separate the two, nice and clean. And then what I do is, really quickly, dead easy, I can then attach the upper rim. And this is for Joe S. Joe asked me this specifically. How do we get a wax rim onto a bite fork? So. I squirt on the bike fork here with foot RD. The rim fits on the top of that. I've got my articulator here. You can see it just there like that. There. So the rim would be on that. But before it goes on the articulator, we've got to do the face bow in the patient's mouth. And this is it here. So here we've got Mavis. So Mavis has got the upper wax rim with the bite fork on, she's holding that in place. Claire pops it in the ears, and I get it all lined up and then tighten it up. But what I'm really looking for in particular, this is really, really important, is that the this upper member of the articulator, just like a Coys analyzer, we want this to be level with the incisal plane of the upper teeth. So that's and that's usually parallel with the eyes. So, and then we tighten up number one and number two. It's dead easy. And then pop it out. So this is what goes back to Rowan here. So this is our upper trimmed rim, the lower pivot, the foot RD intermaxillary record, and the face bow here, ready to mount it on the articulator, dead easy. And so Rowan mounts the upper definitive model with the face bow here, so the plaster's fitted. And then the articulator's turned upside down. And then the lower is the, in our, this is our Manchester rim, is fitted there. And then we've got the patient all ready to go. So now, Quite simply. Now, loads of you have asked questions about vertical dimension and gothic arch, using the gothic arch, and how do I assess that? Now, this is my YouTube channel. It's got all of the webinars that I've done over during COVID and also other lectures that I've done previously. But this one here, which is my Finn's most difficult denture patient ever, this is this actually shows how I use the gothic arch and get the correct vertical dimension. That is, that's a really good one there. And also there is further down is, this is really good. If you want to, this is a special edition, which is like for postgraduates or specialists. And this is a step-by-step -step walk through of three really hard cases and one of you asked about moloplast um so if you want to know all about moloplast b is a soft lining that's the one to go for there so it's all finley just type finley sutton and youtube so now i'm going to just share my screen stop sharing my screen and i'm going to come back to uh, some of the questions of from that now so let's have a look everyone thank you for being with me it's so
<laughs> Maria. So the, what sorry, what do you do if you fitted your RPD and one of the supporting crowns underneath collapses or a filling on it needs replacing? What's your protocol for making the crown fit? So right, so if if we've got an existing partial and we've got a filling underneath that's broken, then what I do is I get a um, like a, a, it's a memosil or a clear index of the shape of the how I want the tooth to be and then I do a filling into that index of that shape and then I'll use occlude spray on the denture in, in and where it touches that filling I'll adjust it so if the occlude touches as in the green uh, powder rubs off on that filling then I'll adjust it so that's that now for doing a crown inside it's more tricky so how i would do that i would prepare the tooth for a crown first and then i would then fit the denture in place and then where the metal work of the denture fits against or would fit against the crown i put in duralay pattern resin or gc pattern resin so i do it with a powder and liquid onto the preparation and gently just build that up so it then touches the inside of the frame itself there just on that part where the denture would touch the tooth and then what I would do is a a crown and bridge impression with the denture in situ and take that out so then the technician has got that exact border but also the um, an impression of the prepared tooth it's not it's not easy doing it though maria excellent someone said here i can't wait to go back to work and try the manchester rims definitely just show your technician how to do it you know with the in the book from these webinars john do you, uh, hi john from italy do you reline dentures after a number of years if there is retention loss and if yes what material technique do you use so john yeah i do i it's i do, do you know hand on heart i don't have to reline a lot of older dentures because they just still fit well but sometimes occasionally if i've just fitted a new denture and and it's just not quite right, or the suction's not quite right, then I will reline it. The material I love using, it's a light-bodied silicone impression material. It's called Doric Flow. It's the green silicone Shotlander material. It's very light-bodied. So adhesive on the, lots of silicone adhesive onto the fitting surface of the denture. Put my silicone in the fitting in there, it goes in and I just border mold exactly like I would do for a um, for, for the denture for the definitive impression itself very very important that I hold it in place myself there so it's fully seated onto the palate because the palate just doesn't resorb so I'm just thinking about getting it down onto the palate or down onto the buckle shelves because they just don't shift at all so it's light bodied um, silicone impression do do so someone's asked me privately do i use pip on the mucosa to mark the ideal post dam position and transfer it to the wax rim no i don't i just look in the mouth and look on the definitive cast and then just draw it on the model i just do it by eye it's just for the fovea i'm really looking for the fovea quite often you can just see them on the impression you know the actual cast So, Takeuki Ishigami, so Dr. Abe told us that his success rate of suction was 80%, but your success rate was 20%. Dead right, Takeuki. He's, he, he's got to be just better at it than me. Um, but I, you know what I think? Truly, I, I do. Um, but first of all, I think that it's, I think probably, and this is, and I don't want to speak out of turn here at all and upset Dr. Arbe, but I think that the uh, dentures are slightly overextended because when I do silicone impressions, they're too big. 
and overextended dentures will have more suction but they may get moved around more but i don't know it's it's just that's my own experience what i do want to stress though is and this is and this is you know i we in fact just before two weeks ago we were meant to be having yammer who has worked with uh, dr Arbe come over to um to the practice in garstang um literally two weeks ago for a study club and yammer was going to and i've already been to japan to learn from dr Arbe, but yammer is going to come over and treat one of our patients and i was we were going to get down to the the nitty gritty of this so it's just really watch this space but Takayuki, what I do say is that the technique is terrific. The special tray design is terrific. Let's use it and work with it. And if you can get a better success, that's just brilliant. But the technique is fantastic. Even we get better stability with these dentures. It's all about the stability. I don't think it, I think the suction's for show, like driving's for show. And like the golf analogy, stabilities for dough, puttings for dough, the actual that increased stability that we get with the Arbe technique is really superb. So Amir Abidi, would you mark the width of, of the nose on the upper rim to communicate canine tips to the lab? No, I don't. Uh, because I use photographs to cal calculate, so dentate pictures to calculate the correct size of the upper central incisors that's really the key to this so no nothing finn do you use the third point for amir you are on it tonight so i don't use the third reference point from the uh from in the kit for the face bow so but i do use the infraorbital notch as my reference position for lining that up so i palpate the base of the orbit infraorbital notch and line the pointer up on the danar face bow with that because we found actually there's re good research to show that's a more accurate position for actually positioning the cast within the articulator it's more anatomically correct to go for the infraorbital notch rather than that arbitrary pointer uh, that comes with the thing. So Anthony, that so I've just answered your question there, hopefully too. Lila Kingston, do you use the bull method for adjusting occlusion, please? Adjusting the buccal cusps of the upper teeth and lingual of the lowers? No, I don't, uh, Lila. Um, I just don't, please. I want simply, very simply, all we want to do is have good positive contacts on the premolars and the first on the sixes and then that's it i'll show you the occlusion just in a nutshell just in a minute lila so tony barn um when doing the reline, how do you avoid raising up the level of the thickness of the denture? Well, just by pressing it down really firmly. So it's not increasing it very much at all. It's very little impression material. Pushing it down is key. So thanks, Takayuki. It's lovely to hear from you from California. It's great. So now let's just... Um, share the screen let's get going again so next is this is another question so so takeuki is doing her resident pros training and this is another question actually this is from matt who's in san antonio texas who's asked about cast cast rest seats versus composite and this is the this is from the this prosthodontist james brudvik he came up with this based in seattle in washington a state in america and br a really brilliant prosthodontist 
And John Besford just thinks he's wonderful, this guy. But he came up with these shapes on the inside of the lower teeth to support dentures. Now, these are, if you're not doing these at the moment, that you must start doing them because if you want your lower free and saddle partial dentures to work really well, these are the business. So these are composites stuck on. I just want to show, share with you, this is Sandra here. So just before lockdown, I was treating Sandra. And so, and how I do it is I'm accentuating the, the cingulum. So sandblast. So I've got my rubber dam on. Sandblast, etch. Composite goes on just like this. And then set it. So the composite I use is HFO by Vanini. It's the Vanini's composite, HFO. It's lovely. I use a crown preparation, chamfer diamond. This is a Shofu chamfer uh, diamond. And just trim off this to make it look like that. Just neaten it up and then use an enhanced finishing burr. It's beautiful. So that's it finished here. You can see that just there. Lovely composite. Now for now the other side for Sandra, this is what we did here. She had an old porcelain jacket crown or porcelain bonded crown, a metal ceramic. So I've taken that off because it looked tatty. It didn't look very nice. And just fitted a porcelain bonded to zirconia crown with zirconia on the back edge with a lovely rest seat incorporated into it. Look at that. And it's just the same shape as the composite. Superb. Now, at this point, when I fitted these, um, Sandra had a, a plastic immediate denture in place. So this was the immediate that I was going to replace later on. But whenever I change shape of teeth, it's, it's always a, a bit of a problem getting the old denture to fit. So this is, I use Occlude to do that. Spray that on and then try it in the mouth and where it's rubbed off i adjust it with my diamond there and this is someone's asked me about adjusting dentures what i try to do is avoid if it's all possible this area here but just adjust it below where it touches the tooth but this is the immediate in place you can see and so i've adjusted the immediate denture just to fit around that composite rest seat and also around the crown here that we've had made there and then what we'll do now is let's fast forward to the definitive denture so here's the crown that we made for Sandra and look at the rest seat there that's lovely that's going to fit beautifully into our composite rest seat and also the rest seat that we've got underneath that crown there and this is that scandinavian design all open to the saliva you know the patient can get a tp through so here's the denture in place fitted look at it fit, fitting beautifully on those rest seats there this denture is not moving anywhere it's lovely so that's the denture fitted for Sandra she's got a full upper denture so this is that um, situation that someone's asked me a question about how do you manage you know a, a full upper against a lower partial so it's really just a question of getting the occlusion balanced perfectly and I'll, I'll show you that just in a minute I'll, I'll talk about the occlusion just in a sec but that's the flange there you can see that just fitting nicely two gold eye bars just at the back around that tooth there so we can incorporate those rest seats both in crowns and in composite but uh, often but i don't he, he actually talked about cast like a bit like a resin bonded bridge rest seat on there i don't do them like that because i find the composites don't come off the teeth so i don't go i don't have the patient going to at that expense to do this Tarek asked me can we do a dental bar without composite rest seats 
Yes, you can, but it negates the advantage of having them. But you can still do it, definitely. You can still add to it in the future if the whole thing fails. So other people have been asking me about, can, we, can you do, do you have to use both bars or can you just do one bar? So, and also about sizes of bars as well for lowers. So if we look at the literature, the minimum size for the lingual bar or the sublingual bar needs to be four millimeters in height and two millimeters in depth to get proper rigidity. But the dental bar itself, sometimes we can make a denture without having that lingual bar and just having the dental bar itself. In this case here, this is Jackie. Jackie didn't want the dental bar being present. She said, I'm not, I just, I just can't cope with it. So we made her a denture like this. But sometimes also we have very limited sulcus depth at the bottom here. So thickening up this dental bar can work really well as long as it is big enough. You know, it's five millimeters wide and 0.5 millimeters thick, but they still work really well. This is, this is Jackie here with that in place. If I have a preference, I do want to have a connecting bar though. I do want a lingual bar really, but this is her denture in place there. And you know, it works really, really well. It's solid and firm, beautiful. So, no movement on that at all. And this is down to extension of saddles and great to support. Lovely. That's great. So quickly, I'm going to move now back to chat. So let's stop share. And then quickly. Do do. That's great. So Finn, do you ever use a lingual plate as a major connector? No, I don't. It makes my head hurt because it really goes against our hygienic principles. I used to do them all the time in here and, and the, I used to think they work well, but it covers the, it encroaches on the gingival margin. So no, I don't do that at all. Um, because the important thing about these things are this the key is look here we've got a periodontally prone patient there the mirror if that was all covered over this area with a plate there it will exacerbate and the literature shows this as well the research from scandinavia shows that it increases the periodontal inflammation and the periodontitis and caries so i don't do it so let's now move a little bit further forward now i've been asked a few things about implants as well so the um, miriam who's a lecturer in jerusalem in prosthodontics has asked me a few about implants and rpds now i don't do a lot of um, implant work with partial dentures if i have a new patient that has no implants and i'm going to make a partial i'll just make the partial and I find that they work really well. But I do get patients referred to me that have had failed bridges and things that, that want, they want fixing. So just like Ken here. So Ken, just underneath that, in this area here, he used to have a failing bridge. And so we kept the back implants, which was fine. So that is the back implant. We put a locator abutment on it. So that locator fits. But if you notice, the important thing is all of the design principles are still there. We've got full extension around the tuberosities. We've got great tooth support all the way around here and full extension around the back. The lovely thing about having an implant there is there's no clasp on here, which is great. And this clasp here, we've kept it tucked away. So that's that clasp there on that back tooth. So the aesthetics are gonna be really, really good. Again, he's periodontally prone, this chap. Keep it away from the gingival margins. That's our clasp on the other side. This is the denture in place at the top. So 
here we've got his natural canine and then this is the artificial teeth on that free end saddle with the implant supporting that upper denture again like lowers Miriam said, what's the best position for implants for a lower, for a partial denture situation? Well, in an ideal world, the best is at the back there. So it's like a table. So you'd have one there, you have support at the front, and then at the back there. So it's a bit like a table or a tripod. But the bone, in terms of ID canal, etc., it's tiger country putting implants in there. These are often the only places that we can really get them in comfortably without grafting. And so it's just using the same principles, really good rigid chassis, open framework, fully extended, right up the retromolar pad. You know, so that's the important thing. Next, a few of you have been asking about occlusion on uh, dentures and in particular this is really important um, if you've got a natural you've got natural dentition just like this lady here so this is carol now carol has i'll explain what she's got full lower complement of teeth and then in the upper arch a complete denture quite simply this is the occlusion that we're looking for here so I've got articulating paper. When she bites together in CR, there's no contact at all of the anterior teeth, but there's grip on the premolars in the middle of the denture. Dead easy. That's all I'm looking for. So now, this is important. I want you to think about this though. The way that I adjust that is when I fit the teeth, when the patient closes together, if Carol said to me, I'm touching on the right side, I'm touching on this side before that side, then I'll put my articulating paper in and get to grip on the side that's touching first. And then I, I would adjust the denture on that side. And I would keep on adjusting it until they are totally even, just like when we go to the opticians and they're asking us to see which circle is clearer than the other, you know, like the green and the red with those circles. And when the patient can't tell a difference, then we've done it right. But this is the rule. Lila, this is the rule. You're asking about a bull rule. I, I don't use the bull rule. If, if I'm adjusting a denture, I try and, deepen fossa and keep cusp height it's important for the articulation that so deepen fossa preserve cusps so if there's a, a mark on the fossa i'll drill out the fossa rather than drilling away that lovely mountain of a cusp so and then someone else asked me about cuspless flat teeth and ridges as well are they not better for flat ridges you know these flat teeth well i did a phd in this and i studied this and we did a randomized trial testing these three different posterior occlusal schemes and we found that the zero degree the flat cusp teeth the patients did not like them as much as lingualized occlusion and anatomic arranged back teeth so we don't use those at all in practice. So even with flat ridges, they don't work. That's what my opinion is anyway. In a nutshell, I could talk for hours about it, but that's very, very briefly. So, but what Rowan always does is, he does set the teeth up like this. This is called balanced articulation. So there's balancing contacts on the non-working side for the dentures. So just to increase stability of the dentures like that. And, but getting oh, balanced know, articulation, that, 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 actual physically in the mouth is very, that. very difficult and to do. And I don't think you side need side to worry side too side much side. about it. Getting that sort of okay. balance, that's really difficult to do. But 
it's a, but, and I don't think it's really essential. I think it's essential to record CR properly. If you look at most dentures, CR has not been recorded properly. That is king. Balanced articulations like the icing on the cake are not hugely important. So, but if you are desperate to get it, and Seema asked me this question, how do you get balanced articulation using this metal paste that I was talking about? Well, this is how I do it. I very, very rarely do it. It's like once every two to three years, I'll have a patient that I've not quite got the occlusion right. And it's annoying the patient, you know, because maybe the dentures are tipping. So this lady here, this is Miriam. She's got in the upper jaw, she's got a full upper. In the lower, she's got a lower free end saddle partial denture, which is fitted onto two implants, the lower. Now, it just moved. I just, the upper, it just lost its suction on the, with the occlusion. And we've done a gothic arch for this as well, and it just wasn't quite spot on. So in these circumstances, I have this bag of grit. These are filings, like metal filings. And I mix that with toothpaste. So here we've got Miriam. Mix that with toothpaste. I'm really careful with doing this. Because, you know, I say, get the patient, they mustn't swallow this. So they spit it out. Um, but they do this, and I keep replacing it and do this for about 10 to 15 minutes, grinding. So do you know what they're doing? They're grinding it in, they're milling in their own occlusion and balancing it. And I get them to try and work on the bit, sand that area down. So this, these are Miriam's dentures, and you can see that she's worn little bits away here by grinding them. and then these are the lowest two you can see that there's little areas that she's worn down there and just doing this made the denture the occlusion okay tap together tap yes, if you work nice and firm go for it nhs practice or like where you've got the, the dentures are really very good deep and the teeth are really soft tap together this works really quickly it works a treat. It takes longer with these really good um, teeth. So, Mishari's asked me lots and lots of really ace questions. And one of the questions was, what's the best way of trimming and polishing uh, the dentures if, if you don't have a lab on site? So, so this is the range of burrs that I recommend. They just go from tungsten carbide burrs to polishing rubbers and then just going through a finer these are show food burrs and then the finishing touch here is just having a, a mop with some polishing paste here and then that just works really nicely if we're doing so if we're using moloplast or a soft lining material then proper burrs are needed. This is a moloplast trimming burr that have got a different shape to them and they, they can cut the silicone really well. But the other thing is, if you are really interested in doing um, a lot of prosthetic work in your practice, I would invest in one of these polishing machines so that you can have, you can have pumice and water on here with a polishing wheel and then have a, a mop with the polishing paste on there and then you can use that to just you can just walk if you can have that outside of the surgery you can just take adjust the dentures polish them up so they're just like new they're lovely so now i've had questions so this is from nevin who's in india and takayuki who is in california have asked me about characterizing gums and teeth um, so, and I've had other questions too about this. So, first of all, Rowan waxes the dentures up so that they are look like they've got recession in the appropriate circumstances. This is all about doing the right thing for the patient. So, everything's waxed up first, and then the dentures are flasked. So, this is uh, Rowan flasking the denture. Now, we use this system. So, this is called Vippy 
and it's by Thomas Gomez, and it's actually a Brazilian product here, and it's acrylic staining. And this is how Rowan uses it. So the dentures are flasked, and then he then puts a powder of this, just sprinkles the powder in to the flask, just like that. And they've got different colors of powder, and it's all in the instructions, but it's also experience of doing this. The more you do, the better you get. Um, so he pops that in, and then and layers that up with all different colors. And then the finishing touch, and this is dead important, is these, these veining fibers. These are candular veining fibers that are just placed in the, the buccal sulcus area, just in the, so this is the non-attached ginger V. Dead important, those little fibers. Beautiful. It's fantastic. And then Rowan flasks, so mixes up the dough, packs it, double packs, and, and then finishes it, cures it, and then the dentures look superb. So we've got this lovely border of the these little bits of veining fiber, not very much, and then the lighter attached ginger V. And then once the dentures processed, that's when it gets characterized. So, so for instance, a really lovely detail is to make a little chip in the edge of a tooth and then a crack down it. That crack is created with a blade, scalpel blade. The tooth is then etched with, a, with um, uh, aluminium oxide. So just sandblasted. I don't mean etched, it's sandblasted. And then HFO composite is placed in there, the white composite, and then a little bit of staining just on the top there. Really important. But I want to share with you how to do that tooth characterization even more. So this is a case here. So this is Ron's denture before it's been characterized, before the teeth have been touched. So, but then what we do is, this is the denture in place after it's been characterized. We have some fun and we cut in holes in the denture and put fillings in. So there's an amalgam there. There's recurrent caries here. He's got toothbrush abrasion and a filling just here. Look on the inside too. He's even got rouge, rouge on here, the denture itself. We do put that in quite a lot and amalgams there. So it's very simple, just cut it out, sandblast, bond, put the filling in, light cure it. And the, th the interesting thing is you've got to make it slightly scruffier than you would do normally for it to, to actually make a difference. So here's Ron and he wanted it really characterized and it just suited him. It's not right for everybody. So that's the characterization bit done. So Hein, Hein joins us this evening and Hein's asked me lots of great questions. It's lovely to have you here. So you were asking about the, the these window dentures are just brilliant for if we've got say two molars or one molar. Now that we've got a metal ring and you were asking, do you have chrome cobalt collar overlay on the single abutment tooth or is it purely acrylic? So if we look at this here, the metal, this is all part of the same metal work. The is this, it's all one bit. And that is about 0.5 millimeter in thickness and that sits directly high on the tooth itself. But underneath that, around the edge of the tooth is a space. So that space has moloplast in it. But before I move on to showing you that, Hein, if we do a reline of this, we, we, with the reline material, we always cut away that reline material again from over the chrome plate just to keep it away. But the, the rest of the denture would be relined in the new acrylic. But inside, pardon me, if you look closely, that's the metal work there, Hein, that fits on the top of the tooth. And then the moloplast grips around the edge of the tooth itself, just like that. It's brilliant. It's like a little O-ring. 
that just grips the tooth and they just work ace they're brilliant so i'm nearly at the end now thank you for uh, staying with me uh, this evening it's brilliant so tony and a few other people have asked me about photography and i love it this is just taking photographs and and then being able to look at them and and see what we've done and audit our work is just wonderful and it, the quality of the photographs really has helped me and rowan and uh, sam and all of us to improve what we do at the practice love it but it's i've got robert craig to thank for this and he's a super mentor for me uh, for my photography he loves it he's based in northern ireland he's brilliant at this but please first of all if you want to find out all the gear that i use go to my speaking page scroll down on that and you'll find this the spreadsheet with it all on but this is my go to so i've got it here actually i've I brought it home from the practice that's my camera it is fan flipping tastic and it's it's a canon 5d mark three it's a it's it's a, you know almost like a professional camera but it's beautiful um and it's got a macro lens twin flash but importantly on the twin flash it's got little diffusers here and here which help to soften the light when a new patient comes in i take loads of pictures all in set sequence and order and i don't need to share with you how to do that because you can download these as guidelines these are orthodontic guidelines that i use which is you can just go to that website find the orthodontic guidelines download them and it has all of those set photos and actually how to do them in there but I do, i'll quickly share with you my this i have three different types of photograph that i do so this is the first one which is the full face one the second one is in the mouth so intraoral and then the third one is lab work and before I show you this video, just look at this these settings here. So on the camera itself, I've got a custom setting, C1 setting, which is on this top bit here. And I all I need to do is flick it from C1, which is a full face, to C2, which is in the mouth, to C3, lab work. So they and those shutter speeds and the f-stops and the ISO settings are all standard. Yeah. So, but this is the, this is my extra oral, or the this is my full face uh, approach. So, if you watch now, I've got a, a mark on the floor, and the patient turns to Claire, so gives her a smile, and then relaxes the mouth. Look, I've got also I've got two flashes. I've got one on the camera and one in that umbrella that fits onto the light there i can just take that off that laser light this thing here that umbrella just comes off when i'm seeing patients but this gives us those lovely views standardized and then i can then audit my cases i've got a massive surgery it's a really big room it's lovely when i come to do my intraoral photos I just click the camera onto C2. I put my twin flash on here, and then Claire has the patient and holds them like that. And then when I do my lab work, this is the key to making the dentures look so beautiful, um, is this cube here, the porter cube. And I have the camera, I'll often have it on a tripod if I'm doing shots on the articulator so my camera's got a remote uh, control for the flashes so there and there and this is how and when the uh, when i press the shutter it ignites the flashes but it puts it through and it softens the light and makes the lab work look so nice and this is how i do it so say i'm going to photograph this here i pick it up put it inside the cube 
take my camera and point and shoot. So, and these are the settings that I use for that, for the Porter Cube is that the C3 there. So C1, C2, C3, so that, that Canon is fantastic. And then before I come back to all of your questions, Joe S and Andrea um, have asked uh, some about what further articles, I wanna read more, please. Now, I've got loads of resources on my website on that speaking page. There's, there's so much on there, I think it would take you, a, you know, it'd be take you a long time to actually read it, but it's there's so much detail in there. And I really want to emphasize how good these three papers are that I wrote with John Besford and that were in the BDJ, British Dental Journal. Just download those. Every sentence is full of detail and, and it, it really will make sense now following watching these webinars. And also, I'm on the on that speaking page there. If you scroll right down, I've put so there's tons of resources like our construction manual. These are our three papers, the design sheet, all our materials and equipment that we use, um, the equipment for for cameras, and some other really interesting papers. But also here examples of treatment plan letters and treatment planning cards so you can actually look at what i send out to my patients and what are in my letters and also denture care instructions tony you've asked about that that if you scroll further down the denture care instructions are in there too immediate denture instructions people have asked me about that just go there download it and have a look at it so if that information in there is not quite enough, then this complete denture book by Dr. Arbe, which is the suction denture technique, which is superb. I'd recommend that highly. The other book for partial dentures, which is not, you can't get hold of this very easily, but you, if, you, if you actually go to a website in Denmark, you will be able to get it. It's, uh, but this, describes that um, the, the Scandinavian approach but also this paper which you can get download from a website's on there too which is the the it summarizes that Scandinavian approach beautifully and this is what I've incorporated into my practice I love it it's got all the sort of little neat design features in that paper it's lovely too so um, I've really loved doing these webinars and it's been great just being able to share my knowledge with people that really enjoy it. And I can tell you love it too. Um, I'm at the moment writing a textbook with John Bestford and we're wanting to make this the best removable prosthetic textbooks that you'll ever see with loads of cases in it. And so you can be able to turn to it and look and see, yep, that's patients like what I'm treating at the moment, and I'll do it like this. So that's what I'm really working very hard on at the moment. And also, the other thing is with, the, with this COVID thing, having lots of people at the practice at the moment, is just not possible like this. And this is what I truly love doing, is mentoring and showing people how to do it physically in the surgery, because we've got a lovely big surgery for it. And we get dentists from all over the world but I'm devising new ways of helping you learn um, and, and maybe just have a patient in and we just do it um, live with like 10 of you on zoom and you can all ask questions verbally as part of that and but I can't wait to get back to, to actually really doing it as well that's great so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to now have a good look at the questions again and see if there's any more before we finish this evening. That's great. So. So, sun architecture, the Kennedy bars you have should, 
shown work really well. Any tips for patients with lower incisor spacing and possible show through? So, yep, Sonny, I think I might. I'm just going to share my screen again because I actually, because these presentations are, I just speak for such a long time, I, in fact, I'm just going to escape that because I need to just find the particular slide that I wanted to show you, Sonny, because this shows you precisely what I'm talking about. Um, do, do, I think I might have deleted it. I've deleted it. So, no, no, I haven't. Great, you can see that on the screen. So, if we've got spaces, then it is an issue. And then, you know, there. So, like in this case, these teeth are really healthy, Sonny. So, there's no, and it's unlikely that Sue, this patient here, is going to lose those teeth. So, we avoid taking the bar over those, but just have nice, again, it's just chunky, big with composite underneath. Uh, rests on there and a proper nice big sublingual bar but Sonny if if you if we had like for instance a post crown on this tooth here that was we, it was likely to fail then I would break my rule of crossing the gingival margin and bring a strut of metal up onto the back of that tooth should that tooth fail we can add it to the denture in the future So, so Joe, Joe Sturmer, Joseph Sturmer, how do you deal with bul bulgy little bulks of bone on the buccal side? On the buccal side, in cases of complete dentures. So it's, I suppose it's a bit like, I've just got to avoid it actually. But also the other thing, Joe, this is really important is, we use surveyors a lot. So um, the path of insertion for uppers is really crucial. So sometimes you'll have like undercut around the anterior bit. So but we make the path of insertion of the denture going like that and it keeps the flange nice and thin. But if we've got a bulky bit of bone on the outside, then I definitely relieve it. Just keep it away from that area so it's not going on it but it can't go over it because it will then just rub on that but it often takes some little bit of silicone checking with the denture in place just to adjust it around that area john what material uh, for a denture would you use for patient allergic to methyl methacrylate um i don't know actually because we, it's something that Rowan and I have talked about a few years ago, but I've just not come across anyone that is allergic to it at the moment. So we would look for a particular material that we could use, and there are there is material on the market. You know, you could theoretically there are definitely materials that you could use. You could use peak as the base, and then composite on as a gum material on the outside. But there are definitely products, and I just, but I just can't remember. We'd have to look that one up. But I do think that this is really important, John. Is the uh, it's the monomer that is uncured that is still the monomer is present in there. So I think flasking and packing, and then put and leaving in the water bath and heating, and the way that Rowan look does all of that it reduces the monomer content and I know that. And then also you've with your, um, the other system, the Ivercap or the injectable materials is very little monomer, but I don't know. I can't answer that properly, John, for you. Shazza Ahmed, Deepening of fossa in occlusal adjustment, does it cause any effect on lateral forces the denture has to bear as opposed to adjusting the inclines of relevant cusps when deepening and 
no idea, Shaz. <laughs> so um, that is, look, it's just, we can just get totally obsessed with occlusion. I, if we, if we shorten the cusp, that if we shorten the cusp, it's less likely to have balanced articulation on it. So we want to preserve that cusp height and have a deeper fossa so that then we've still got balanced articulation. If we've got shallow cusps, let flat teeth essentially, it's very difficult to get balanced articulation. But seriously, it's just not important massively. The king is centric relation, nice even contact, um, and then get the patients to chew differently. Make them they have to become a chopper, not a grinder. So they've got to learn how to use these prostheses because getting true balanced articulation, it's in the textbooks, but in the reality, the reality in patients' mouths with dentures, it's very rare it will be fully balanced. And it truly isn't that important. And there's good scientific evidence to show that too. There's certain schools of thought like Slavicek in, in Austria um, is that canine guidance is the right way to go for complete dentures. And there's, there's been a few randomized trials looking at canine guidance versus balanced articulation and canine guidance came out better. It's quite interesting. So the patient's just got to learn how to manipulate. So the key to this is great impressions, great fitting dentures, even occlusion in centric relation, balanced articulation, it's fine. If you want to do it, you can do it, but it's not that important. That's, that's really what I think. Do, do. So what, Amir, what is a good blowtorch for bite registration? Thank you, Finn. So when I do the bite registration, so Bunsen burner, just a normal little Bunsen that you have in schools, you know, for doing your chemistry experiments is spot on. That's great. Hi, Drew. That's brilliant. That's great. Lovely. So that's all the questions done. Thank you very much. It's been, you've really made lockdown much better and actually really helped me to sort of crystallize my thinking about um, dentures. Thank you so much for joining me. And I really hope you stay really well. And, um, and also I hope to see you again, um, you know, at some stage in the future, you all stay, stay well and namaste. Um, good night. Thank you.